Hey everybody, I'm Mike Sattel, the founder of Sattel Tutoring, and this is the third episode in my 10-part series on the overall strategies for the new digital SAT. In this episode, I'm going to talk mostly about the outline questions, which are a new type of SAT question that appears at the end of most reading sections, and we'll talk about the main strategy and how to apply that same strategy to other parts of the reading section as well. If you haven't already, I do recommend that you start by watching the first episode in this series, which covers the main strategy for the reading section. I will talk about it in a second, but I think it'll be good to have that baseline before you get into this episode or any others. But just so you know, all the other episodes in this series can be watched in whatever order you want, just so that you can target your weaknesses. Um, but make sure too that you please subscribe to my channel so that way you're always informed whenever I release a new episode or new video, new resources. They're also going to be available on my website, Satel tutoring.com. It's the best way to get free SAT prep for this version of the SAT and any future versions that come out. But let's start by talking very quickly about the main strategy for the reading section, which I have called dumb summaries. Here are the basics, but to summarize even further, just don't worry about the details in most of the passages. Think about connotations, simple ideas that you can focus on and use to narrow down your choices. You don't want to worry about every single nuance and detail. You just don't have the time. But in this episode, I am going to contradict this a little bit. I am going to make you think about the details, but not in the passages, in the questions. And so let's take a look at why that matters. And we're going to use one of these outline questions, but I'm going to present it in a weird way. Here is just the answer choices for one of these outline questions. So without any other background, let's just read these out loud. Choice A. While the Asian black bear lives primarily in forests, the American species can be found in a wide variety of habitats across North America, including wetlands and cities. Sounds cool, I guess. Choice B. Both Asian and American black bears have a varied diet that includes berries, nuts, insects, fish, and small mammals. C. Due to loss of its forest habitat, the Asian black bear is classified as a vulnerable species. D. One of two species of black bear, Ursus americanus, is commonly found in North American forests, mountains, wetlands, and urban areas. Well, if you love facts about bears, then this is great. Here's four of them. But which one is the best fact? I don't know. And neither do you. You might have a feeling, you might be drawn to a choice here, but it's completely based on you. We don't have anything to go on, and that's not good. So if all of these choices just kind of seem fine to you, that's because they are. We don't have a task yet. These questions are not testing grammar, they're not testing style, and they're not testing your opinion. So we are going to be given a very specific instruction and we're going to need to follow it. It's not in the answer choices. It's also not in these bullet points. I'll read them quickly just so you can see, but they're going to sound very familiar. While researching a topic, a student has taken the following notes. There are two species of black bear. Like most bears, black bears are omnivores, eating a varied diet of berries, nuts, insects, fish, and small mammals. The American black bear, Ursus americanus, is commonly found throughout North America, in forests, mountains, wetlands, and even urban areas. The Asian black bear, Ursus tibetanus, is primarily found in forested areas across Asia. Asian black bears are classified as vulnerable because of habitat loss and poaching. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact same things that appeared in the choices. And this is another key component of these outline questions. You're not being tested on the facts. The choices are not going to take these bullet points and summarize them incorrectly, at least not really that I've seen. We've only gotten four practice tests as of the making of this video, so maybe future uh, reveals by the College Board will kind of counteract this a little bit. But as of now, you're not being tested on whether the answer choice uh, correctly presents the facts in the bullet points. In most cases, honestly, the choices are just going to kind of exactly state the bullet point, maybe with a few changes to the words, but it's mostly going to be the same. So that leaves the last part of this question, the literal question. Let me show you what it says. The student wants to emphasize a difference between the two black bear species. Which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal? And here is where all of the work is going to be done. The question is giving us a very specific instruction. We need to emphasize a difference between the two black bear species. So now we have a reason to look at these answer choices and start to think, well, do they accomplish that goal? If not, we can get rid of them. And to me, the most obvious failures are C and D because they only talk about one of the bear species. C is about the Asian black bear, D is about the American black bear, but if we need to talk about a difference between the two species, 
then how are we going to do that if a choice only mentions one of the species? So that's a very clear failure, and hopefully you would notice that and be able to cross that out. Now, looking at B, we have this word both that starts things off. And already that makes me think this is going to be wrong because a word like both is used to show a similarity between things, not a difference. And if we look at the choice, sure enough, that's exactly what it does. Both Asian and American black bears have a varied diet that includes berries, nuts, insects, whatever, right? So they're saying that they have a similarity. And notice that choice A starts with another kind of key word, the word while, which is a word we use to show a contrast. And if we keep reading, while the Asian black bear lives primarily in forests, the American species can be found in a wide variety of habitats across North America, including wetlands and cities. So there's a difference in where they live. This is definitely the answer. And this is how most of these outline questions are going to go. If you read the question and understand your task, the answer will be obvious. The problem most people have with these is they just kind of look at the bullet points themselves and kind of find the things that they find most interesting and then find a choice that sounds the best or captures the facts in a way that, that they want to be captured. But it's not about you. No one cares what you think. The SAT is giving us a very specific instruction and it is our job to follow that instruction. Nothing else matters. Not grammar, not style, not how interesting the fact is, not whether the goal that we're given is actually an interesting or useful goal. We just have to give them what they want you, your opinion does not matter. Let's look at a little bit of a harder one, and this time I will just give you the question as you'd see on the test, everything at once. The order that we should attack this though is make sure we read the question first and understand those goals. Don't read the bullet points, read the question. The student wants to emphasize how few mangrove finches there are relative to other Galapagos finch species. Which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal? So the, the let, uh, end part is going to be the same no matter what. But you can see I highlighted the beginning part in two different colors because to me this is actually two different goals that we need to accomplish, two different instructions. We need to mention how few mangrove finches there are and we also have to kind of compare them to the other species, right? Relative to other Galapagos finch species, we're going to need to make a comparison here. So I separate those goals so that I can kind of sort through these choices a little bit more confidently. Now for our next step, some of you will want to read the outline bullet points. And that's fine. I don't think it's really going to hurt you to do that. But so far with the practice tests that I've seen, I'm able to answer these questions correctly pretty much every time without reading the bullet points at all. Uh, maybe I'll read them after and I'm sorting through the choices, but I go right to the choices here because I, if I understand the goal and I know that the choice is not gonna lie about the facts and the bullet points, I don't really need to analyze the bullet points at all. I'm just looking to see which choice does the two things that I needed to do. So let's just look at choice A then. A recent study found that 10 of the 18 species of Galapagos finches are classified as of least concern because they had populations greater than 500 individuals. Well, this is obviously wrong because it doesn't mention the mangrove finch at all. And that's the first goal that we have. We got to talk about that finch. So I would go right to number uh, letter B here. I wouldn't really worry about the other goal at all. Biologist Verdugo Hammersmith found that the mangrove finch with only 20 to 40 individuals is critically endangered and several other finch species are considered of least concern or vulnerable. So it very obviously talks about how few mangrove finches there are. And if you're worried about it, you can go looking for that information in the bullets and we can see the third bullet point basically says that exact same thing, that there are only 20 to 40 individuals. So again, it's not the facts aren't going to be wrong. It's just going to kind of copy paste those facts from the bullets to the choice. So we needed that fact because the question told us to get that fact. The other part maybe is a little trickier. Uh, it's critically endangered and several other finch species are considered of least concern or vulnerable. So that kind of sounds to me like we're comparing the mangrove finch to the other finches, right? It, it's, it's kind of at least mentioning the other finches, so maybe that's right. I don't know. It doesn't jump out as being obviously right to me, but I would definitely keep it in the mix for now. Um, and then you can see if you want to check that the fourth and fifth bullet points there kind of say the same thing. They add even more information. And it's not necessarily bad that Choice B leaves out that the of least concern is 500 individuals. It doesn't need to capture everything. Um, but we can see where this fact comes from. So let's just look at C and see if that's any better. With only 20 to 40 mature individuals, so the mangrove finch population, we're talking about that, uh, is considerably smaller than most other Galapagos finch populations. So there I do think, again, we have this kind of comparison. They're saying it's smaller. So 
At this point, I wouldn't really worry whether B or C is more correct. I would look at D and see what that does, and then we'll worry about the, the slight differences later. Uh, so looking at D, uh, they kind of flip things here. While most species of Galapagos finches are classified as of least concern or vulnerable, so here they're doing the second goal first. They're talking about the other finches first, and the order doesn't matter. That's not a problem for me because it also accomplishes the second goal, or the first goal, I should say. The mangrove finch population consists of 20 to 40 individuals. So again, we're hitting that fact. And we can tell from B, C, and D, it's very obvious that that first goal is accomplished no problem, right? They, in each of them, they mention the 20 to 40. But the blue goal is where it's a little trickier. And at this point, you know, B, C, and D all seem to maybe be hitting on that point. So how are we going to decide? I'm not going to go back and reread the bullet points. I'm going to go back and reread the question because that's really where this, the work is done is in that question. If I'm stuck between choices, it's probably because I'm not quite grasping the specific instructions that they're giving me. So I want to go back and make sure I really get it. So what does it say? The student wants to emphasize how few mangrove finches there are relative to other Galapagos finch species. So it sounds like we need to talk about the number of other finch species, how many uh, individuals those species have. And none of them come out and say it, right? You can look at the bullet points. None of them talk about the 500 individuals in the least concern groupings. None of them talk about the 100 to 250 in the vulnerable groupings. So how, which one is getting close? Um, if I look at B, I do start to see a little bit of a problem. It, it's mentioning the least concern, it's mentioning the word vulnerable, but it's never really defining those things. And so is it really comparing the number of these other finches to the number of mangrove finches? It's kind of counting on us to know what vulnerable and of least concern mean in order to kind of make that connection ourselves. But we're not allowed to do that. And this is maybe why it's better not to read the bullet points to start, because you're going to absorb those facts and information, but you have to read the choices from the perspective of someone who's like reading an essay or an article who wouldn't have access to all the outlines that the author of that article kind of put together as research to write the piece, right? So we're not allowed to read into the choices facts that are stated in the bullet points and just be like, oh, well, people would know that. Mm, no, it, it's got to be in the choice itself. And let's compare that with choice C, where it still doesn't mention the number, but it uses a number word. It uses the word smaller, which is talking about how many of these finches there are. It's a smaller number. It's a smaller population. So if I'm looking at B versus C, B accomplishes the goal only if I understand what it means to be a species that is vulnerable or of least concern. Choice C, though, just comes out and says that the mangrove finch population is smaller than the other populations. It's just making a comparison. And at the, at the end of the day, that is what the question is telling me to do in blue, is to make a comparison. So C is going to be the answer here because it does that. D, you can see, kind of falls short in the same way as B. It's talking about these, these terms, but if we, are, if we don't have access to the research, we wouldn't know what these terms mean. We wouldn't know how that compares to the mangrove finch population. So we really want it to be as specific as possible. And that's the takeaway here, is if you are between a couple choices for the outline questions, go back to the question. Odds are good that you just kind of miss something specific that they want, and that can help you sort through them a little bit more clearly. And this same strategy will apply to other parts of the reading section. Here's a passage question. And many of the passage questions have a very simple question. What's the main idea of the passage? What's this about? But not all of them do. And so we have to always read the question to make sure that when we're given specific instructions, we're actually following those instructions. So in this case, they don't seem particularly linked to the passage, but they do tell us, don't worry about the whole passage. Which choice best describes the function of the underlined sentence in the text as a whole? So we have to focus on that one sentence. So I'm going to quickly read the passage. I would read everything here. Maybe some of you can get away with just reading the, the underlined part, but I, I would want to read everything for context. 
So it says John T. Unger came from a family that had been well known in Haiti, a small town in the Mississippi River, for several generations. John's father had held the amateur golf championship through many a heated contest. Mrs. Unger was known from hot box to hot bed, as the local phrase went, for her political addresses. And young John T. Unger, who had just turned 16, had danced all the latest dances from New York before he put on long trousers. And now, for a certain time, he was to be away from home. That respect for a New England education, which is the bane of all provincial places, which drains them yearly of their most promising young men, had seized upon his parents. Nothing would suit them but that he should go to St. Midas' school near Boston. Hades was too small to hold their darling and gifted son. So, I'd probably want to do some sort of dumb summary of the underlying portion. I don't really understand all of it, but I can kind of tell that they're, they're talking about education and what the parents want, and so... The parents want a New England education for their son. And there's more, probably more to it, but those words I understood, and that's probably enough to just kind of get started. So let's take a look at the choices now. Choice A, it provides a detailed description of John's hometown and family life. Well, John's hometown and family life are definitely talked about. They're talked about in the first half of the passage, right? They talk about Hades near the Mississippi River, his father, his mother. So we're getting a lot about that. But it's definitely wrong because it's not what the underlying sentence is talking about, right? So this is a clear trap answer. They want you to pick this because they want you to just not be paying attention to what the question is asking. And just kind of out of force of habit, you're just like, oh, this sounds like a good summary of the passage. So I'm just going to pick it. And because you're lazy, you might not even read B, C, and D and see what those choices have to offer. But first of all, we always have to read all the choices. But second of all, this is why the question is so important. We need to make sure we're not falling for traps like this. This is a good summary of the whole passage, but that was not our task. So it's a bad answer choice for this question. Let's keep going. It suggests that John's parents have educational values that are shared by others. Well, our dumb summary and the line did talk about his parents. Education definitely came up too. It said they have a respect for a New England education. I'm a little bothered by the end part where it says it was shared by others, but you know what? Let's worry about that later. Let's see what C and D offer and, and see if they're any better. Uh, C, it demonstrates that John is unusually talented compared to other boys in Hades. Well, talented rings a bell. They, they mention at the end that he's their darling and gifted son, so that sounds like talent. But there are strong words in here that bother me, and this kind of gets to some of the th things I've talked about in other episodes. Unusually talented. Well doesn't seem to suggest that he's unusually talented, and it's not really comparing him to other boys. In fact, if anything, the underlying portion seems to be saying how John is, is similar to other people. So uh, this, this is wrong based on the, you know, the passage as a whole and on the line that we're being directed to. So this just doesn't seem right. D, it describes the artistic abilities that qualify John for an expensive education. Well, if we read this really quickly, we might say, oh, artistic abilities, he's dancing all over the place. But you know, they're not really saying that the dancing qualifies him for this education. And it's certainly never talked about as an expensive education. So we're not allowed to assume that. So those are strong words that stick out to me in the choices. I can't back them up with the passage. So this would be wrong as well. And that's good. Then I would just pick B at that point and move on with my life. But if I really wanted to, I could also prove that last piece that these values are shared by others. I don't really notice it when I first read the underlying portion. But when I go back, I, I do see that they're talking that this respect for the New England education is the bane of all provincial places. So that sounds like maybe something shared. So I don't know, but it's good enough for me to just be like, all right, I'm going to pick it. And all of this was much easier because I knew from the start what I was looking for. And really, that is the takeaway for this question, for this entire episode here, is we really need to make sure that if the question is giving us a specific instruction, we are following it. The outline questions in particular are really all about the question. These are pretty much at the end, so you're gonna be short on time, but they're usually easy questions. We really wanna get these right. It's an easy way to boost your score. And if you're focusing on the question, it should be easy. You don't even need to read the bullet points because all the choices are gonna be summaries of the bullet points. So we just need to focus on which summary is the right summary that the question is asking. And the same way of thinking can definitely help us on the passage questions as well. Many of them will be giving us specific tasks. So we always wanna make sure we're not missing that task as we sort through the choices. And you can be sure that if there's a trap answer, it's probably going to be based on misreading or not reading the question. So they're going to take advantage of you if you aren't really focused on that question. And it's tricky 
because I do say in that first episode that our goal for the reading section should be to avoid looking at the details, to just dumb things down. And that's good when we're searching through the passage, which is long and complicated and, and just has a lot of facts thrown at us at once. But it's bad to be dumb when we're looking at the question, because there we're, giving, we're gonna be given a specific instruction, and if we miss it, we're gonna be answering some other question that's just not gonna get us the right answer. So we really, really need to know when we can think just kind of about the basics and when we have to really pay specific attention to what they're telling us. Hopefully this helps you on these new outline questions. Just make sure you subscribe to the Satel Tutoring channel so that you never miss a new episode or resource. Um, and I really appreciate all of my followers, so please do that right now so you don't forget. But otherwise, remember, when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less. Satel for more. Thanks for watching.